Okay, so we're going to do one more video with some additional terminology on curves that we didn't cover in the, the previous one. Um, in the last video, we, we talked about some of the language around curves, like what it means for a curve to be smooth. We talked about orientation of curves. Um, we talked about how to join two smooth curves together to get a piecewise smooth curve. Um, and, uh, and a few other related things. We did some of the notation that comes along with that. So we talked about like C1 plus C2, this kind of notation. Um, one of the things that we didn't talk about though are closed curves. So, a closed curve is going to be one where there's sort of no beginning or end, right? No beginning and no end. So what you want to think of here is, is think of a circle, right? Think of, you know, any kind of object like this that goes around, you know, forms a loop, right? So there's no beginning, there's no ending, it's just one, one loop that goes all the way around. Um, if you were to parametrize this curve, right, we might still want to parametrize a curve like this, and so we might still want to define, you know, a map R going from A to B into R, you know, either R2 or R3. Maybe we should say Rn. Well, we'll say R3. So what you might deal with here is if you want, if you want to specify that this should be a closed curve, we might simply say that R of A should equal R of B, right? So the idea is that you start at some point, right? You go around the curve, and you end at the same place that you began, right? So this is the idea. Okay, so closed curve, no beginning, no end. Um, I'm gonna lose this green color. It's not, uh, it's not all that great, right? So we start at one point, we'll go around, and at the same point, that's what it means to be closed, okay? Um, oops. We can also talk about uh, simple curves. So, simple curves, these have no self-intersections. Okay, so this curve here is an example of a simple curve, uh, a curve that say something like a figure eight, right? Something where you have that point of self intersection. This is not simple, right? It's still a closed curve, but it's not a simple closed curve. Okay, so we have this idea, right? So anything where it intersects itself. Um, you want to be careful too with your parametrization, right? You want to make sure that the only, so basically in, in terms of a parametrization, one way to think about what it means for a curve to be simple is that if, um, you know, if, if R of say T1 equals R of T2 with T1 less than T2. So we want it so that the only way you get the same value for two different points on your curve, right? Using some parameterization is at the endpoints. So T1 equals A and T2 equals B, right? So other than the endpoints of the interval, which both kind of map to the same place, you ask that there are no other places where there are two different T values, oops, that give you the same point on the curve, right? That guarantees that you don't have this self-intersection. Um, some people actually will, you know, they might just say there are, there are no two points, period, and, and one of the things they'll do is they'll say, actually, let's, you know, rather than doing the closed interval, we could do like a half open interval. You'll see that sometimes as well, right? So that as you come around, well, you get arbitrarily close to that point, you never quite reach it, but that's okay because you already caught that point at the beginning. Um, so. You'll, you'll see either approach, either one is fine, I think you can do it either way. Um, so another thing we can talk about, we can talk about a curve being closed, we can talk about it being simple, um, we can talk about it being uh, positively oriented. 
So the positive orientation is the basically the counterclockwise orientation, right? Um, so so positively oriented means counterclockwise orientation if you're thinking in terms of a circle. So that means that you'd be going around, right, in, in this direction for this curve here, right? Um, it's a little bit trickier. See, when you have a non-simple curve, now it's a little bit harder to say what the positive orientation is. You can still work it out, though. Should be this way, going around this way, this way. Ah, see, here's one of the things. One of the reasons why you got to be careful about this is that this works for this region here. Um, but the other, the other way to think about the positive orientation, right, is that you'll notice that if you have a closed curve, especially if you have a simple closed curve, then there's, there's some region D that it's the boundary of, right? Um, so if, um, if your curve C bounds a region D, the positive orientation is the one where you want D sort of on the left. Uh, in the sense that if you imagine yourself walking around the curve, or you imagine like a person walking along the curve, right, then their left foot is always inside the region, right foot is always outside. Um, that's your positive orientation. But you can see that there's a problem when you have a curve which isn't simple, which is that, okay, my left foot's inside the region, I'm going along, going along, going along, I cross this point of intersection. If I keep following the direction of the curve, right, you'll see that, ah, suddenly my left foot is now outside, my right foot is inside, right? And, and so if I wanted to try and orient this and, and keep a positive orientation all the way along a non-simple curve, I'd have to suddenly change directions when I get to this point, right? I'd have to reverse the orientation and go around that way, which is, which is slightly awkward, right? It's not very natural um, from the point of view of a, of a parametrization. If you were trying to give a single parametrization that did one complete loop of the curve, you'd find that that was a little bit difficult, right? Because you'd, if you were to parametrize, any sort of natural parametrization would have you go that way and then you run into trouble, okay? So, so if you want to maintain this positive orientation for a given parametrization, uh, you probably want to make sure that your curve is simple, right? Um, one of the things that you can do if you have a curve which isn't simple is at that point of self-intersection, generally you can split this up, right? You can take that pinch point and think of this as, as two simple closed curves that happen to share a point, right? And treat these two sections separately. That's one thing that you can do. Okay. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, you can also talk about the sort of outward pointing normal vector, right? Okay. So at any point on the curve, right, you can, you can introduce this normal vector. And this is, this is sort of, uh, I guess, I should, I should be clear that this is something that really only makes sense in the plane. So if we're in the context of Green's theorem, which is about to come up, right? This is, the reason we're doing this is we're going to need this language for Green's theorem. Um, so if it's a curve in the plane, then it makes sense to consider, you know, a normal vector at every point on the curve, right? So there's your normal vector n. Okay. Of course, you also have the... tangent vector, say t, right, pointing in the same direction, or pointing in the direction of the curve. Um, and so there are, there are a few ways to kind of make sense of this, right? Um, so we want to say that the normal vector is outward pointing. So, so what can we do to guarantee that this normal vector is outward pointing. Well, one thing you can do is even though these are vectors in the plane, um, you can still make sense of, of cross product. And there is, you know, this uh, 
these like right hand rules and these sorts of things for cross products where you can say, okay, you, you take your, your hand and you imagine kind of curling from one vector to the other and you see what happens. So you can, you can work out using kind of right hand rule for cross products that um, you want the cross product n cross t cross with the unit tangent vector. Um, you want this to be in the sort of positive z direction, so in the plus k direction. All right. So you can make sense of this. Uh, the last thing to note is, is if you have these simple closed curves, like I mentioned, these, these are generally a boundary, right? Um, So some other notation that you might see, uh, if you're given a region D, okay, um, then, and, and D is, you know, a region that we can integrate over, right? So um, we don't want to consider anything too exotic, um, but so D is going to be some region, let's say, in the plane, right? So D is a region in the plane. Later on, once we've talked about surfaces, we could talk about the, uh, the curve that bounds a surface. We could do that as well, but right now we'll stick to the plane. Um, so given D, uh, we'll let, um, so we might call it C. The notation you might see is that same kind of curly D that you use for partial derivatives, uh, like this. Uh, this will denote the positively oriented boundary. Okay, and so this is simple enough if your, if your region D is kind of, a, if it's a bounded, closed, connected region, um, then, then the boundary is going to be a simple closed curve. We're going to be in this kind of context here, right? Um, some things to note is that, so some weird things that can happen, um, if D is, is not connected, Right? So if, if my region was actually, say, two regions, right, and both of these were just kind of different parts of D, right? So say D1, D2, and D is going to be the union, right? Then they have boundaries, so we might call those boundaries C1, C2. In this case, you would write you would write the boundary of D as C1. You'd use that same plus notation, C1 plus C2, to say that you're taking the two curves together. Um, even though these curves don't actually join, right? They don't, the two curves don't meet, they don't intersect. So it's not like before where we were just joining two curves together. Um, we'll still use that notation because it'll still be the case that when you're doing the integral, Right, if you wanted to integrate something over the, the boundary of this region, which consists of two pieces, you're going to have to integrate over this and add the result to what you get when you integrate over that, right? Um, you'll have to deal with both. Uh, the other thing that could happen is you might have a region which is connected, but it might not be simply connected. Right? So if I had a region that looks something like this, oops, sorry, that's supposed to be all joined up. Right? And it's got a couple of holes in it. Well, you can still make sense of this. So D is going to be this region. Um, we're going to have this curve C1 on the outside. Uh, if we give the two holes on the inside, if we give them the usual, say we give them the, the counterclockwise orientation, you realize that that's not the correct orientation for the boundary, right? Because if I'm going around this, um, then D is actually on my right. I want it to be on my left. So I should actually take those two curves 
with the opposite orientation. So anyway, if we, if we had that orientation to begin with, we might say in this case that the boundary of D would be C1 minus C2 minus C3. We might write it at that. Uh, if, we, if we had the other orientation, if these were oriented going the other way around, then of course we could do C1 plus C2 plus C3. And again, you have this, this notation, even though these curves don't connect, um, you still end up using that notation in this context. Um, okay, so we'll make use of some of this language when we want to talk about Green's theorem, which is what we're going to do in the next few videos.